Hello and welcome. This is Rasheem with The Counter Narrative. And this is episode, what, 15? I don't know, 14. I'll correct that later. Um, anyway, tonight's show is going to be on being brown and healthy. And I have two lovely guests joining us that are going to share with us all about being brown and healthy. I'm going to go ahead and bring them on right now and um, introduce them and also allow them to introduce themselves and tell them, tell you a little bit about themselves. So uh, tonight with us, we have Michelle Antoinette Nelson, who is the founder of Brown and Healthy, as well as Lynette Caban uh, of La Fuerza, La Fuerza, she's testing my R rolling tonight, uh, of La Fuerza Fitness. And she's also the director of wellness programming at Brown and Healthy. So welcome, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys so much for being here. So I told them, you know, that I told them a little bit about you. I told them your name, but tell us a little bit more about you in terms of, um, tell us what is it that you are, a, what is it that you're passionate about? What is your relationship to the topic? And let us know something about you that we cannot find out from a bio. Go no, nope, you can go. All right. So I got <laughs> I got the go ahead. So my name is Michelle Antoinette Nelson, as you said, Rashid. Um, and uh, aka Love the Poet. I am a former Division One track and field athlete. Mm -hmm. Um, I ran track for see since I was 14, so I was about 23. So I guess that's what nine years. Um, and I have I have a passion for um, just mental, physical, emotional well-being and, and working with our people as a poet and a performance artist. I've traveled the world um, as a, a, the longest running member of the Punani Poets, which is sex education theater and came to fame on HBO's Real Sex. So over those years, I've been um, on the troop for eight years. I've learned a lot about what people in our community especially think about um, their relationship with their bodies their relationship with their mates mentally um, and emotionally and their relationship with being open beings um, and open-minded. So um, I'm also, well, one of the things you can find out about, you can't find out about me in a bio. Um, hmm, that's a hard one. Um, I think that um, although I am a, uh, a performance artist and a founder of a global health and wellness initiative, Brown and Healthy. I'm actually an extremely introverted, introverted person, meaning that um, I have to go home and be home for maybe a, f a few days, like to recharge. And I don't necessarily need outside people to um, feed off of, you know. And I think that's kind of a, a misnomer when people think that just because you're a public figure. Um, you must be extroverted. You must love and crave attention. And that's really actually the opposite for me. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, um, first, what was the first question again? Let's start the question. Sure. Can you, you can start with question, please. Yeah, and you can start with any either one that you want. But it's uh, what is it that you're passionate about? What is your relationship or interest in the topic? And tell us something about you that we can't find find out from a bio. All right, so I am passionate about healing and helping others learn how to heal themselves. Um, uh, my relation to the topic, well, I um, am a personal trainer, a healing touch practitioner, and I've had my own journey and um, with fitness and illness, um, and overcoming illness using nutrition and fitness um and people don't know about me i am kind of shy <laughs> both of you have such a similar uh not on bio <laughs> <laughs> not on bio response no so that's good so i want to talk a little bit more about uh both of your relationships uh to the topic and just kind of how did you come to an interest in health like what was the story that led you to the focus on health like um michelle i know you mentioned that you were playing like you were in track for like a long a long time but sometimes people could be in a sport and not really be trying to be healthy like they just running or whatever <laughs> oh, oh 
you you absolutely you're absolutely right. Um, I think that it came. It actually came after the. Um, I, I would say I wish when I was running, when I when I was an active athlete, that I understood what what I was doing was was for in the long run. Like now I'm I'm 35 years old. And one thing that really has pushed me and I think a number of my, my cousins and family members toward um, the health and wellness field, because a lot of us are, are doing things. My sister is a, is a health and wellness blogger um, and a fitness, a plus, a, I'm sorry, a plus size model. And, and we're all pretty like body conscious and aware of like health because we've lost so many um, family members, uncles, um, and, and grandmothers and grandfathers and, you know, like I, I don't, all of them have passed. And, um, I think that that was really what, what got me thinking about my personal health and, and just, and, and I just started hashtagging Brown and healthy cause I'm Brown and I'm health and I was trying to be healthy. So it was like a motivation thing for me, but I think it was, I think it was the, those points, like just focusing on the fact that we've lost so many of our family members and just changing the way that we had our cycle in that. Um, for me, <clears throat> my mom died when I was 19. She um, died, she was obese. Um, she died from a heart attack in her sleep and a number of other issues um, going on due to the obesity. And then um, I had my own issue with lupus. I was diagnosed with lupus in May of 2012. And that changed my whole life. I was very, very active before then in dance pretty much my whole life. Um, and then that all came to a stop. And I lost my ability to walk like a normal person. I had a cane that led to a walker. Um, I, had, I had seizures. Um, just pretty much falling apart and having to learn to navigate this new illness and this new body and trying to find a new me, a new healthier me, because I would never go back to the person I was before lupus. Um, and so I, I really am dedicated to teaching people how they can get past that. Like their illness doesn't have to be who they are. It's just something that they have to deal with. And with fitness and nutrition and meditation and healing touch, all of those together can really change the outcome. Love it. Um, you talked a little bit about <clears throat> body image and body consciousness, I should say. Um, what are some of the what are some of the misconceptions that you have experienced around bodies, uh, how bodies look and uh, perceived health around it? And like how how exactly do you address that? Um I, I think I want to I want to jump in here on this one. Um, I have an interesting perspective. So um, I'm five two, about 115, 120 pounds, give or take. Right. Um, to most people, I have no problems in the world. Um, I'm healthy. I'm whatever. And that's not the case. I think that one thing that people need to understand is that even if you're small, doesn't mean that you're healthy. Um, it, 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 it means that you may have genetically, you may be genetically predispositioned to being small. You know what I mean? And I've always experienced that, like this, the opposite extreme of the same problem. I can't find clothes that fit me right. I'm a black girl that's five foot two with a body like a black girl. You know, I mean, I got one curve, you know what I'm saying? And it's my butt. I gotta be honest with y'all out there. Um, and and so I can't go into certain stores and buy certain clothing because of European cut, because I'm petite, but I'm not petite. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I think um, what I ended up writing a poem for a, a show I was doing called Come On Son with Rebecca DeCoss, Bria McCormick and Shelly um, says so. And I, I wrote it talking to like Monique, who does the the comedian who used to do the, the stand up bit about skinny bees. I don't know if you can curse on here, but um. You know, I was just like, hey, like we have we have feelings, too. And I think the misconception is that we're sitting on top of the world and we we have just as many problems. We have opposite. You know, we, we have health issues as well. 
And I think that that, that has always been a, a thing for me, trying to understand it, because I've always empathized and understood the the plight of someone who was, um, uh, you know, plus size. And and no one ever wanted, everybody thinks it's, it's a, it can be a joke to make fun of me. But if you do it on the opposite extreme, you're a bad mm -hmm. guy, you know? I think that that's one of my things. Um, for me, I've been across the board with my weight um, and different sizes all my life. Um, growing up, it was bad if you were skinny. It was bad if you were fat, but they had to feed you and then they would starve you. It was just very confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, then as an adult, I the, the smallest I've ever been, so I'm 5'10", mm -hmm. right? The smallest I've ever been was 128 pounds. And I still thought I was fat and I was a plus model then. So I, I was actually wearing like a size eight and it was extremely small for my, my frame. And I'm modeling and I'm so confused because I'm really skinny, but I'm a plus model, but then they're padding me up and it's because of the way I'm shaped. Because mm -hmm. I'm pear shaped according to them. I just have hips and a butt, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. then, my highest weight was 292 and that was just about three and a half years ago i started to come down after i got off all the medication but i was at my sickest but also i was at my sickest when i was 128 pounds mm. so i can be all these sizes and not be healthy mm. right and i think that the the important thing here is having a consistent, healthy lifestyle. If you fall off the wagon, you know, don't beat yourself up. Just get back on it. Um, and also appreciating yourself where you are and not being so hard on yourself. So if you are on a weight loss journey, know that you're going to have setbacks. But if you're eating right and taking necessary steps, then you're on your way. And you may not lose all the weight and you might not look like a bodybuilder or a fitness pro, but you'll be healthy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to because right. really um, uh, Steph has a lot to say. She, she wanted to ask you guys, um, she says, I'm curious to know how you feel about healthy, the healthy at every size movement. I'll give you an opportunity to respond back. She also says, it seems as though obese slash overweight people is the most accepted form of discrimination. Like it's acceptable to make fun of them and other things. But she also mentioned that she lost a hundred pounds about 10 years ago. And also, do you think it's okay to randomly compliment people on their weight loss, even if you don't know the reason why they are losing weight? Um, well, let, I guess let's take it one question at a time. Um, I, I think that, uh, so how do you feel about healthy at every side, at the healthy at every size movement? I think that's great. Um, I, I honestly think that it, I think that a lot of times as Americans, especially we judge books by their cover and, um, someone who is 400 pounds could make a decision tomorrow and work for that decision for a whole month or two months and have they've changed the way they're eating. So they are healthier in that moment. They are healthier at that size than they have ever been. And it's step by step. And I think that it, it, it takes encouragement from people to say, hey, you know what? I see what you're doing and if you keep that up, you are going to be, you're moving in the right direction because really it takes 21 days to develop a habit. So it can take 21 days to beat a food addiction. It can take 21 days to um, get addicted to health and fitness. I mean, it, 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 it's there at the bottom line. I think that, yes, I think being, I think that being healthy at every size is a thing and, and I, I applaud it. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's see what we have. Um, it seems as though obese, overweight people is the most accepted form of discrimination. You know, I really don't know if I can intelligently speak on that because especially in 2016, there are so many yeah. wildly accepted forms of discrimination. I mean, thank you, Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, you it takes, you know, somebody said to me, 
the other day uh, about it was a certain circumstance that was happening on Facebook in a certain group of people. And they were like, you know what? They, they're the, that's they're being um uh, uh that's petty today. And I was like, if all it takes is one person to say one statement in a status, and all these people in a certain scene have all these comments, they weren't just being petty that day. They're consistently petty. <laughs> so you understand what I'm saying? Like it shouldn't take just one statement. To unearth all of these mm. things, so Trump. That's like a microcosm of, of the bigger of the macrocosm, the Trump idea. Like it took this one guy mm. to just say a couple of out of off the wall mm. things, and now all of these people are snowballing out of out of everywhere, being so brave and right. doing blackface on, you know. And and so I feel like it 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 may not be the most accepted. I I don't really know, but I think it's about perception. I, I noticed you said you lost 100 pounds 10 years ago. So I feel like maybe that's a, a sensitive space for you. So you, when you hear it, you feel like you're, it's, it's, it's louder. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm just assuming. but So I think that the, um, the accepted form of discrimination, I think it all depends on the person. Because that's also goes against the whole curvy movement, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the percentage of people in the United States who are obese, there, I, I think, I don't think it's an accepted form of discrimination. I think it's become, unfortunately, the norm that people are obese and they're unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't say that I have ever experienced any discrimination because of my physical size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've watched people, you know, I, growing up, my sister is, um, she's been 5'8 and, and plus size since she was probably 12. And she was the captain of the cheerleading squad. None of that stopped her from being what she wanted to be. But I would be at the football games and I could hear people making fun of my sister. They didn't know she was my sister because we don't look anything alike. And I would hear them making fun of her. And that, in that moment, I realized that, you know, there are mean people in this world, no matter how successful you are, no matter how amazing, nobody could jump higher, nobody could do the splits better. She was a captain for a reason. She was a leader and she was still treated poorly by these young people who were just immature and couldn't understand that you can be healthy at every size. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Vibe asked, how much of an issue is childhood obesity? Mm. Well, that's a huge issue um, because that's setting our kids up for failure at a very young age. If we're not teaching them how to eat properly, but that comes from the parents. So if the parents are not educated on how to eat properly, they're going to teach their child bad habits. And then it just becomes um, a trickle down effect throughout the entire family. I, I want to ch chime in here on that. She's absolutely right. And I wa also want to say that McDonald's is a problem. Mm. I just, I'm going to get on the, I'm going to get on the soapbox. Like I, I just have to, it's not food. We all know that it's not food. They have published the ingredients to these things that they're feeding us. Um, McDonald's is on every black radio station. Actually, Radio One Studios always shouts out saying they're at the McDonald's studios because they're the head sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, it's 365 days in the black community is their mantra. Um, they are on every corner, just like liquor stores. And they are still touting 100 billion serve. And, they're, and, they're, and their numbers are slowing down a bit. They have, they've had to do a couple of tricks to get people to remain around. But I think one thing that I always notice is that people are taking their children to get happy meals mm. and, you know, and, and, and taking them to get some French fries and some ice cream to appease them. And I think that um, somebody said to me the other day that their kids don't even know um, about like fast food and things like that. Like, because, and, and when they go out to schools now, like when they go to school now, public school, they don't, they don't engage in like eating the nonsense because they weren't taught that from a young age. You know what I'm saying? So I think that it's, it's, it's really a, a sensitive issue about childhood obesity because you don't want to be like, Oh my gosh, my child is eating 
fat and she's and that's not baby fat anymore but that's like a fact we have to like realize and see and then think about what your role was because children can't feed themselves mm -hmm. no that's an excellent point and i see steph brings up um you know the origins in terms of like sometimes how we start and how we start to look at our nutrition in terms of breastfeeding or whether it will be the bottle in terms of breastfeeding i think coming from the background of working in direct service social services breastfeeding is definitely a choice um it's not for everyone not everyone can produce the proper amount of milk um, and there are illnesses that can prevent a mother from breastfeeding. I think it starts when we're introducing foods to our children rather than buying the, you know, GMO filled baby food, make it yourself, teaching them from there and then consistently introducing new vegetables and fruits and healthy ways of eating as they get older and going to preschool. Um, I, I know that children who are breastfed tend to be healthier. I understand that, but I think that it's the education piece mm -hmm. and access too, because there's a lot of food deserts in underserved communities. So they don't have access to the foods that they need. Right. No, that's a good point. Food deserts definitely have an impact, especially when it comes to like you're talking about fresh fruits and vegetables, or like if I just don't even have like public, like if I don't have transportation. Um, there's plenty of times where I see um, mothers getting on the bus with their children and they have to haul like, you know, so much uh, groceries because they don't have anything like that around them in terms of, um, in terms of food options. Um, one of the things I want to ask you about, and we kind of touched on it a little bit, um, in terms of the impact of culture, because uh, we're talking about brown and healthy. So one of the questions I want to ask is, what is the significance of being brown of healthy? And what, how, how has uh, your individual cultures impacted how you, your relationship with food? Um, so brown and healthy, uh, just to give everybody an idea of the mission, the movement, and the nonprofit organization, um, brown and healthy came about when I, like I said, I, I, ha I was hashtagging it. I'm brown and I'm healthy and I was trying to motivate myself. Um, and that was about three years ago. So in the, in that three years, the social climate has changed drastically. And we, we touched on it a little bit. Um, every day I was waking up feeling like I'm just at war with the, with the world, you know, um, every day it's another name, another hashtag, um, another event. A, a hanging, a, 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 um, a noose, you know, I mean, that goes back to even the genus six. Um, but I feel like the last three years have been particularly potent, uh, church, church killings, all of those things. And I started to think, what can I do? Because I, I mean, I really am internally a militant <laughs> um, person, like, you know, always know that something is just not right when it comes to the way that black people uh, in America are treated. And, um, a friend of mine made the logo uh, for Brown and Healthy, and I'm wearing a shirt now. Let me show you. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Somebody um, made the logo, and I thought, wow, this is way bigger than me. So um, in December of 2015, I decided to launch the movement and get the shirts and, and start talking. And our mission is to change the narrative and change the world. What we need to understand is that when you look at Facebook, Twitter, whatever, hashtag health, Hashtag fitness, hashtag wellness. You're not going to see too many people that look like me. Not going to see too many people that look like her. You know, you're going to see, if you do, you're going. it's going to look unattainable. It's going to be like a bodybuilder or something. And it's just, just going to look like it can't be you. So I was asked to speak at a graduate convocation. And they asked me to speak a little bit about Black Lives Matter, which I thought was interesting because I, I was just supposed to talk about how I'm a self-made artist. Um, but I was glad about it. And I started to think about the narrative. So either we are the wire or we don't exist. Mm -hmm. I looked at a Baltimore magazine and in it, it was very few people. I mean, one or two that were brown with like really curly hair. So what they were kind of ambiguous, you know what I mean? Um, and so I was like, you know, we keep thinking about this mattering. 
And that is very subjective. That's an opinion. I was taught in elementary school not to worry about if people have thought that I mattered, right? But being very declarative and saying that I'm brown and I am healthy and wearing a shirt or hashtagging that, that's 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 something you cannot deny that, that we as a people exist. So um, it, we're filling a gap. We're trying to, to, to change the idea around black people, brown people. And brown, I use specifically because black is often a blighted term. One day I looked up derogatory terms for African-Americans and black was in the list. <laughs> because honestly, how many of you all have ever opened a crayon box and thought you looked like the black crayon? You know what I mean? Your melanin is is brown. We own that. We are melanated people. We are from Africa. We should embrace that, right? So I like brown because it it forces people to acknowledge that you don't get to compartmentalize people. You have Latinos who are in the African diaspora. Like we are all one and are of African descent. So we need to like embrace that idea. So that's why brown is a specific specifically important for me because I feel like we have to start reclaiming the definition of one who we are and the narrative around what we do and how we exist because oftentimes we're looked at to serve the underserved and the children but nobody wants to acknowledge us and our needs and that we actually are here as productive members of society. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm a little passionate about that, but that's that, that's the reason for the name of Brown and Health. Yeah, no, that's good. So so tell me um also um how has your culture uh impacted your relationship with food? Like what are the foods oh. that you grew up with and what are the few foods that you eat now? Are they different? Are they the same? What is Oh, you just, I got this smile because you made me think about my mama and my grandma. Mama them. Mama them, okay? So um, my mom is from Nashville, Tennessee. And she always gets upset because people think that she's so country. But she was born in East Nashville. Nash Nashville, Tennessee is a city. Um, <laughs> and um, however, it's Southern, you know? Uh, and so my dad is from Germantown, Ohio, right next to Dayton. That's you know, Midwest, very similar culture. So his mother has recipes that she passed to my mother and I'm talking fried chicken, collard greens. Uh, I grew up uh, seven day at Venice. So we did not eat pork in my house, but my mom did back in the day before she had ma married my father. Um, you know, just, just you know, grits, uh, steak and eggs when I go to grandma's house, uh, you know. So, I mean, food was was cooked in my house my mother would make meals and um i actually me, my sister and i actually worked really hard to get my mother to change her diet and to understand how that would like shift her weight loss and and things like that but i mean i, I had a very interesting relationship with food i actually only ate because i was hungry i didn't even really like growing up i didn't even think i was you know i just want to go out and play i didn't really it wasn't a thing i ate because I, I i had you know high metabolism and I was hungry, but it wasn't until I got to be an adult that I started to like enjoy going to dinner and like eating and flavors and smells and being a foodie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for me, well, I'm Puerto Rican, so hey, Puerto Rico. Oh! So uh, <laughs> Puerto Rico, Puerto mm -hmm. Ricans, we like good food, right? Rice and beans, chicken, pork. Platano, everything thick and heavy, right? So growing up, food was a huge issue for me because I was so confused. I was in dance at a very young age. And you have to get a certain weight and size in ballet, in ballet point and stuff. So there was a lot of pressure there. But then, like I had said earlier, I go, um, when I would go to my family's house, it would be your, um, too fat or too skinny. And then they would force you to eat or they would tell you, you need to diet and like tear you apart. And by the time I was 15, I was already abusing diet pills and I learned how to starve myself, but eat just enough so that way nobody would question me. Mm. And I was working out like insane. I would run 
10 New York City blocks to um, the gym, work out for two hours hardcore, then run back home to do a Billy Blanks video wow. before bed every single day. Wow. I was obsessed because I had to fit this idea of, of skinny that everyone wanted me to fall into. And I was just like, well, how am I supposed to navigate this as a woman? Because I'm going to fluctuate in my weight. I'm a curvy Latina woman. I don't want to put this on my daughter. And so it's it's a sucky relationship with food. Because and, and I tell people, like when I'm doing my workshops with folks, I tell them I was force fed to eat vegetables because I would throw up as a kid. I would forcefully throw up as soon as they put a vegetable in my mouth. I just didn't want to do it. So then they would have to hide the vegetables in my food. I didn't get to enjoy my first salad without throwing up until I was 30 years old. Wow. That's huge. Right. That's a terrible relationship with food. Because I had this thing, this connection that if I put vegetables or anything with a weird consistency in my mouth, like an like a, a orange, I throw up. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn how to do that. So I'm malnourished. I'm sick. I have all these ailments, my autoimmune diseases. And here I am having this horrible relationship with food. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Dr. Vibe, man in the place to be. What's good with you? Everything's good. Thanks, ladies, for sharing on this important topic. Uh, two, two quick comments I want to make. I'm going to make them. and I'm going to jump off and listen. First of all, one of the challenges that we have brown people with our food is the food that tastes the best a lot of times is not the best for us. Right. And can you speak to power about how easy it is to eat healthy? Oh, yes, absolutely. So one of the things that I love to do, um, <laughs> one of the things that I, I absolutely love to do is juice. So the reason why, it, and my eyes are lighting up, I can see my own self. Um, <laughs> I get really excited about it because you can get all your fruits and vegetables. I personally am a vegetable juice liker. She's a fruit juice liker. <laughs> we meet somewhere in the middle. We'll um, celery stick in Hey, 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 listen, <laughs> I, I like to juice the ginger, the carrots, the cucumbers, the beets. Yes, I said beets. Um, <laughs> like all of those things in one and you, you, I mean, you can have eight ounces or 16 ounces and you've got your nutrients for the day plus some, and you don't have to eat them. You know, like I, I try to, you know, have my, my, um, healthy food groups on my plate when I eat, but sometimes you just can't, you can't get there. Like I know I'm as an artist and an entrepreneur, I'm on the road a lot. So sometimes I'm like, Hey, I got to stop and get a burrito just so I can make sure I get all my veggies and my, my, you know, my grains, my meats, all those wrapped into one. Um, but I get really excited and, and it's super easy to juice. Like you can even prep your vegetables and put them in containers the day before. You don't want to make your juice and, and keep it on the shelf too long. It doesn't have a really long shelf life. Um, because it doesn't have like the preservatives and all of that stuff. And then it is new, it's nat natural, it's fresh. So, um, you want to like, if you want to make it easy, cut, cut everything up, depending on what kind of juicer you have, if you have to do that, have it ready and just kind of like meal prep. And it, it's going to change the way you feel about life. You can even add like some, um, uh, the greens, the scoops of greens you can get from the store and, um, protein, protein probiotics, like all those things you can add to it just to give you that extra boost. And and I, I think it's really the best thing since sliced bread, honestly. Mm. So we talked a little bit about um, eating and uh, juicing and different uh, healthy habits to take on in terms of that process. What are some movements that we can like really incorporate into day-to-day -day life? Because I'm going to be honest with you, like I don't like to exercise. It's just it's a thing that I do that I know that I have to do, but I don't like it. What I do like to do is I like to dance. I like martial mm -hmm. arts. Uh, I even like walking. I don't think of walking as, I like strolling. I don't like this walking. <laughs> but what are some things that we can do? Hiking. Hiking? Oh, yeah. yeah. I would like hiking. You would, would like hiking very much. Okay. Um, I think 
So for someone like you who's like, I want to exercise, but I really hate it, it's finding something that you love to do that is physical. So dance. You mentioned dance. I love to dance. Even if you're dancing around your house for 30 minutes, just looking crazy, but you're getting a good sweat on, you're getting your heart rate elevated, you feel your muscles burning, you just did 30 minutes of cardio. Um, also, you know, come to my boot camp class on Saturdays at 9 a.m. in Boom. Jordan Hill Park. Boom. <laughs> the and, um, you know. <laughs> did you hear it? I did hear oh. it. So, Here's the thing, it's just not straight boot camp and I'm not just yelling at you. We're actually dancing and having fun and incorporating boot camp drills in between dancing. Mm -hmm. So you're having a great time and you're getting your workout on. Another thing is stretching, making sure that you stretch regularly to keep everything nice and limber, keep things moving. And it also helps with chronic pain and illness, it helps you sleep at night. So just finding something you like and being consistent. And also, we're going to add uh, her boot camp to the Brown and Healthy calendar. So you can go to brownandhealthy.com, go tomorrow, and you can uh, RSVP. We'll put a link in the calendar so you can RSVP to join the class on Saturday. Um, also, all you, need, what you really need is 150 minutes of cardio mm -hmm. a week. So that you can get that however you need to get that. Um, cardio is not always running. I'm gonna say that again. Cardio is not always running. A lot of people feel like when they hear the word cardio, they gotta go and run like miles. One thing that I am a, a yes, Deve per week. Oh, he said yeah. <laughs> we just answered it. Um, uh, but you can get it if you go. Like I, I'm a big proponent of hiking. Um, that's one of the, the ways the Brown and Healthy hashtag really, really got started. My, my friend Maria Hay, who was actually in charge of our fitness challenges, um, we're going to start one October 1st. We just finished the 30-day fitness challenge. We're going to start another one October 1st. It'll also, we posted it on the website and on the Facebook page and all that. So follow us at Brown and A-N-D Healthy on Facebook um, and brownandhealthy.com. And, and we're going to keep those challenges going. But... Um, Hiking is a excellent full body workout. And like Rasheen just said, she doesn't like to like power walk and feel, you know, cause that's, I mean, it's really a step down from running. It's, 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 you're going to burn the same amount of, of calories because, because you're working your body the same, the same, um, at the same rate, basically. Um, if you ever notice somebody jogging the same pace that you walk, yeah, you're kind of looking at it that way. Um, the only thing that changes is when somebody's doing like the sprints and things like that. But um, hiking, you are definitely working. You're working your legs. You're working your arms. You're working your core, which is a very big point of contention for a lot of people. Ab work. You, everything you do starts at your core. <laughs> at Right here in this trunk, this area right here that you got, this midsection, everything starts here how you stand upright it's how these little two feet we have hold us up so so you that if that is weak if if that is coming if that's undone you have a lot of of other issues that are coming from around that and no just sitting and doing crunches and not doing any cardio that's not i mean you're strengthening it but you're not going to lose any of the pounds mm -hmm. so you you got to kind of you got to do both and a great way to do that is to hit a trail Plus, it's very meditative. And we talk about mental, physical, and emotional well-being. I mean, you can really open up your mind and your heart and become one with nature and outdoors, which we are supposed to be. We're supposed to understand those cycles and understand the outdoors and be one with, with everything that surrounds us in our in our atmosphere, you know? So it, it's it's twofold. It, it has a really it's it's really good for um, your health and your wellness. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. So for everyone so for everyone that's a little going through this is the counter narrative. I am Rasheen and we are talking about being brown and healthy. Um so you have really given us some really good things in terms of what we could do in terms of juicing, prepackaging, juicing, dancing is approved, yay. Uh, <laughs> stretching. Uh, 150 minutes of cardio per week. Like we could do that, right? 
Uh, yeah, uh, hiking <laughs> so much fun. That just sounds like I'm such an explorer. I would love to hike somewhere. Um, and the significance of core work. Is there something else that our listeners could do, like within the next, I don't know, 30 days that they that if they did? Because you talked about developing new habits, like 21 days. Is there something they could mm-hmm. do in the next third over the next 30 days that you think that would give them a pretty good um, impact? Yes. <laughs> Go in. Go in. I challenge everyone for the next 30 days to drink half their body weight in ounces every single day. Ounces of what? Water. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Don't go drinking half your weight in liquor. No. Oh. Don't do you clarified. Yeah. Somebody would have been like that. Yes. <laughs> All right. I got you, boo. <laughs> Yep. Um, so many of us are dehydrated. Yes. And then um, with dehydration, you have a lot of ailments. Your muscles hurt. Your bones hurt. You can't think straight. You have headaches. It just, we're made of water. So we need to drink half our weight in ounces of water every single day. Mm. And I will be the first one to tell you, I am guilty of not doing that. Um, so I have to join this challenge as well. I, I do drink a lot of water though. Like in my refrigerator, you're not going to see anything but water and maybe some tea. Um, and right now I'm on a ginger ale kick just because I'm, I, I'm, I'm be really honest and transparent. I'm trying not to drink alcohol for, uh, I don't know. I don't even know, maybe a couple of weeks or something, but I, I'm using the ginger ale to just, Hey, be like, Hey, I want something a little stronger than water. So let me just have some ginger ale. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you gotta you gotta do it. Ginger ale and a wine glass. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so I, I think that also, um, if you're not allergic, try coconut water as well. Mm. Uh, a lot of people don't like it, but I mean, it doesn't taste like anything to me. But it's actually super hydrating. great for hydration. It's the only like juice from uh, I think a, a, a um, coconut is fruit, right? It's considered a fruit. Um, it's the only. It's uh, a nut. It's a nut. I'm Thanks, sorry, Ryan. Uh, obviously, clearly. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Duh. Um, but if the juice can be put in IVs and put directly into your bloodstream, that's mm. that's how that's how potent it is, and it's a natural kind of remedy for um, being dehydrated. So try that out too. If you find that you want to mix it up a little bit, throw some coconut water in there, guzzle that down, and you'll 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 really start to feel great. Awesome. And some people like to infuse their water with fruit. Um, if you're going to do that, that's fine. But try and get as much pure water mm-hmm. in your body as possible. Because remember, fruit has sugar. Unused sugar turns to fat. Mm-hmm. So just think about it that way. Half your body weight, so half my pound in ounces. Right. So oh, if Lord. someone weighs. 200 pounds, they have to drink 100 ounces a day. Okay. So here, here's the trick on doing that. So you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth. As soon as you're done brushing your teeth, drink 20 ounces before you even have coffee or tea, whatever it is you have in the morning. But you better have breakfast. If not, you got to see me. Um. <laughs> they also say that it heightens mental, um, your thought process to drink first thing in the morning. Right. It heightens your thought process, gets the digestive system awake and ready for the day. And then right after you have breakfast, you drink another 8 to 20 ounces. So then, again, you have a snack. You drink water with that. Your lunch, water before, during, after. Before you know it, you've already drank 100 ounces. And it's what, 4 o'clock in the afternoon? I feel like you're good. I feel like Lynette chick tricking us, y'all. She making this out so easy. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy. I'm not gonna say that. It does take practice. Um, I'm not perfect at it. I have my days where I can guzzle a gallon and a half, and then other days I'm like struggling to get my water intake in. No, that's so I'm not perfect. You know, I'm I'm not ever gonna say that, but Keep trying, keep working at it, and you build up to it. But when you start feeling how great your body is looking and you're feeling the energy and your skin is clear, you're going to say, hey, I need my water. You're going to realize when your stomach, you feel like you're having hunger pangs, you're actually thirsty. Drink water first. 
wait 10 minutes and then you'll see you don't have hunger pangs anymore. You were actually thirsty. Mm. No, that's good stuff. So before I let you guys know, I want to know a little bit more about both of the organizations, uh, La, La Fuerza Fitness as well. La Fuerza Fitness. La Fuerza, listen, my arms, I'm working on it. Uh, La Fuerza Fitness as well as Brown and Healthy. I know you guys have an initiative coming up. I want you guys to let everybody know about that um, as well as how can they reach out to you? How can they connect, follow? All of that good stuff. So I'll briefly talk about La Fuerza Fitness so Michelle can go in on our, um, the Brown and Healthy Initiative and our event coming up. So La Fuerza Fitness um, started out of my journey um, from healing from lupus and fibromyalgia, or overcoming rather, because I am not cured. I live with the disease. Um, La Fuerza is my nickname that I was given to me after my mother died. La Fuerza means the strength. Um, so after my mother died when I was 19, my godmother would always tell me, Tu era la fuerza, you are the force, you are the strength. Sigue pa'lante, keep moving forward, no mire para atrás, don't look back. And so through that, I had to find my strength when I was going through lupus treatment and just constantly being disappointed with my body because it wasn't responding well to treatment. And so la fuerza became my daily mantra, like I am La Fuerza, I can do this, I got this, I can walk to the bathroom, I can feed myself, like those little things. And so La Fuerza Fitness was born after um, I went through physical therapy, aqua therapy, learned how to walk again and all that good stuff. And I started working with a trainer and then my trainer said, well, you're a trainer, so get to it. Mm -hmm. And so, my birthday last year, November 4th, um, I launched La Fuerza Fitness. Oh, it's almost about to have a birthday coming up. Oh, yeah. Yay. Oh, yeah, and it's your birthday, too, of course. Which is <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right. No, that's awesome. And I love the I love that you shared uh, part of that story. And uh, it makes me that much more interested in trying to make sure I get that name right, the strength. Uh, so I appreciate that. And Brown Healthy, what's up? Right. I got to follow that. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so before I do that, I just wanted to show you something. Okay. To the people and to you. So we use this. This is a plastic container you can get from like a Rite Aid, a Walmart. I would say Walmart is probably cheaper. Um, it's, I don't know how many. How many? Uh, oh, this, this holds five quarts of water right five so quarts. yeah so we're fortunate it's kind of like you know how they sell them in deer park the deer park um comes in you can get one like this size this jug mm -hmm. um it's similar to that so we're fortunate it depends on how you look at it but we try to be optimistic our water here comes out boiling hot so we don't have to boil the water it actually like it's it's you can see skin smoke. yeah it's really bad <laughs> it comes, um, is the boiling hot yeah, our, yeah, it comes out of our faucet like super hot. Good thing there are no children here, right? Um, but we're using it to our advantage. And so what we do is we fill this up mm -hmm. to the top from the straight from the faucet and put it in the refrigerator. Now, I was born in 1981. Mm -hmm. I used to pour, and so was she. I used to pour water out of the faucet and drink it. Um, and it was okay. I am here. You are here. I'm sure the all people in here remember faucet water. Now I'm making this point because if you look at faucet water and bottled water, faucet water is number one way more regulated. They have to check it at least I think three times a month to make sure that it's it's safe. Unless you're in Flint, was it Flint? Yeah, Flint. Unless you're in Flint, that's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. But um. They have to check it at least three times a month. Bottled water is shelved and it sits in warehouses for we don't know how long. Um, they just started, maybe a couple of years back, started making bottle companies put that it's not spring water mm. and putting where they're getting the water from. Dasani is tap water. Mm. Just so you know, there's a sister out there who's done this test where she does the alkaline testing yeah. on the bottle. Look that up on YouTube. Um, I'm sure just put in like the alkaline test 
um, for the bottle of waters, you'll find that there are a lot of pollutants and issues with bottled water and you're paying for that. Mm. So I'm a little bit old school. Well, if you want to boil your water, if it doesn't come out as hot as ours do, ours does, but you can save a lot of money that way. And you can always, you'll always have a drink, you know? So I know I cut into my brown and healthy time, but I spoke a lot about it earlier, but let me just say that Brown and Healthy is a global health and wellness initiative for people of color. It's mental, physical, and emotional well-being. We just won um, the Elevation Award from Baltimore Corps and a slew of other partners, um, meaning that they just gave us $10,000 toward our innovative programming idea for Brown and Healthy Kids. Kids Ooh. is also an acronym, Kindness, Intelligence, Determination, and Strength. Um, it couldn't have come at a better time because and, and that funding is going to help us um, that that's actually that funding is actually going to help us uh, put that put those uh, put the programming in schools and community centers and different places all throughout West Baltimore it's focused on West Baltimore but it couldn't come at a better time because we were planning to do a fundraiser for Brown and healthy the organization we have a speaker series every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at Dove Coat Cafe, where we have brown health professionals um, and all walks of the narrative come in and talk about what they do and how it can help you. And there's a talk back session and it's really awesome that we hope to grow into something a lot bigger. But we're having a fundraiser uh, this Thursday, 9-22 um, at the wind up space. And you can find out more information about it going to brownandhealthy.com right now. Hey, there it is. Thank you, Rasheem. You can click that link right now. And if you go to get your tickets and put in the code BENEFIT50, I'm going to write that in here. Code BENEFIT50. You'll get your tickets for half off until 930 tomorrow morning. So as opposed to paying $20 for a ticket, you're going to pay $10 for a ticket. We have the best of the best performers who are also arts activists and working with young people and and people of all ages in the community to uplift and change the narrative our whole mission is to change the narrative change the world we have to start taking the abstract idea and making it tangible and then we're starting from with every walk of life so that's brown and healthy and we hope to see you at the benefit concert because it's going to be a daggone good time Bad, oh, bad time. Time. <laughs> Love that. Oh, it's a silent auction, so you can get some things. Oh, yeah. So, so let people know how they can contact you. How can they get um uh Snapchat website? You already mentioned that. Instagram. Yeah, everything, uh, everything brown and healthy. We don't have a well. Love the poet has a Snapchat, but since Instagram introduced stories, I must say. I'm doing the stories on Instagram. You can go to Love the Poet, L O V E T H E T O E T. Um, and you can find Brown and Healthy there as well. B R O W N A N D, Healthy. Uh, Lynette is putting hers in there right now. These are my Facebook um, web pages. Okay, okay. Um, and, and yeah, and just type in Brown and Healthy in Facebook. Make sure you space Brown, space, and space healthy. Because sometimes it doesn't show up, or if you just look at the hashtag Brown and Healthy, you can find us. That's everywhere. Awesome sauce. Oh, no, don't, don't use lovethepoet.com. Oh, That's sorry. not going to take you. <laughs> That's not going to take you where you need to go. We have evolved. If you want to see my artist work and my, I'm also on the radio. So tune in um, tomorrow at 88.9 FM, WEAA, the Mark Steiner Show, for my segment, Booth Stories. I'll be in, inter, interviewing. I can't talk tonight. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Ah, ah. Um, <laughs> I'll be interviewing Shelly Sesso, who is also hosting the um, fundraiser event and a stage I'm curating at the Baltimore Book Fest on Friday called Rock the Podium. Rock the Podium. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I want to thank everybody who is still here in the room with us. Ryan, thank you for being here. If Malcolm is still up and he didn't go to bed yet, tell him I said thank you. Uh, Steph, thank you for being here. Dr. Vibe, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Devay, Deve, I think I'm saying it right. If I'm not, uh, charge it to my head and not to my heart. Um, I want to say it right, Devay. Um, and of course, um, 
love the poet, AKA Michelle Antoinette Nelson, as well as Lynette Cabal. I don't know why I want to say like Cabal. 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 <laughs> I said it right. Yes. Ugh. I like when I get a name right. Um, thank you again so much for participating in this, sharing your inner genius, letting your inner slay combine with my slay. What's your cat's name? Aura Ruby. And she wanted to say hi. What's you want Aura say hi? Ruby? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't got time for y'all. You know, I don't got time. Um, <laughs> thank you again. And uh, good night. Peace. Good night. Peace.